Hello, welcome to the Wednesday, June 17th, 2020 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Today we got an interesting story from Xavier about something that's really a layer 8 problem dealing with people and not with technology. And well, as they know on the internet, nobody really knows that you're actually a dog or a cat. So it's pretty easy to pretend to be someone else. And we came across a Russian or actually Ukrainian, I believe, forum that does sort of just follow that motto with dating sites. This forum consists of individuals who register with dating sites using female names and uh, photos and then they're waiting for married men to have a date with them at least online so nothing actually happens in real life and once they have enough information about uh, these individuals they're posting it to the forum in order to extort money from their victims. Now, the theme of uh, this forum is very much uh, that they essentially are sort of uncovering unfaithful husbands, but uh, in the end, it ends up coming down to money. They will ask for money to have any posts removed from the forum. Now, even if someone pays and the post is removed, this isn't really all that terribly effective, given that Google will, of course, cache these pages and the information can often still be found. This forum has been operational for a couple of years and is still very active with several posts daily and a few thousand posts overall. So lesson here, well, be careful who you trust online. And yes, with dating sites and such, you never really know who is on the other side. And actually, uh, many prior studies and so have shown that uh, the majority of these profiles is often fake. And of course, it's not always just the fake profiles that are a problem. In another story today, there was a large leak of an AWS account that leaked dating profiles for about 100,000 different users from various apps for users with alternative lifestyles. And while it's a little bit early to ask for a public postmortem post from T-Mobile regarding their outage yesterday. All the evidence so far points against a denial of service attack and more in favor of what T-Mobile originally mentioned, which is a configuration error. As so often, it doesn't really take a lot of hackers and DDoS power to take down large networks, but a bad update will do the job just as well. Now, if you ever built a Docker image, the first thing you probably did is you looked for a base image, essentially your Linux distribution or whatever you use there, and then you added a couple additional components to it. So a lot in Docker really depends on this library of available base images. And there are literally thousands of them out there. So some researchers from Norway now looked at the security status of these base images. They ran 2,500 of them through an open source security scanner, and then they split out how many of them were vulnerable based on the status of the image. Now, in Docker, you have sort of four different types of images. Depending on how careful these images were verified before they are offered to the public for download. The lowest tier here is certified, which really just means that, well, uh, the user has an ID, has logged in when they upload an image. And no surprise, that looks pretty sad. 82% of these images had security vulnerabilities. But even the best level, which is the official images, 46% of them suffered from security vulnerabilities. And the most common vulnerabilities are related to JavaScript and Python, which is not really a huge surprise because there have been sort of a lot of updates uh, to uh, these languages over the last couple of years. 
Well, and the takeaway here is that if you are using Docker and you're relying on these images, which pretty much everybody does, you should certainly make sure that you harden your Docker images and limit access rights to limit the probability of any of these vulnerabilities actually being exploited. And then for those of you who are dealing in the industrial control system world, I would like uh, to point you to a note that was published today by the CERT Coordination Center at Carnegie Mellon University about the Trek IP stacks of vulnerabilities. Now they're calling them the Ripple 20 vulnerabilities. And essentially what it means is that there are multiple bugs in the IP stack that uh, depending on the configuration can have various effects uh, on the system. Now they're a little bit vague here describing the impact because a lot of this depends on how this IP stack is exactly used on a particular system, but certainly something you should be aware of, you should be patching. The difficult part maybe is that in a lot of these industrial control systems, it's not really that obvious that you are using this Trek IP stack. So you may need to refer to respective vendor announcements and until then, well, you should do this anyway. Try to block uh, abnormal IP traffic from your control networks. And well, that's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.